So we're, we're moving back into a plenary session, uh, as you know, and we're going to continue the flow from the last session on, on uh, children, adolescents, and youth. So this is a little bit improvised, but I wanted to make sure that Karina, not really improvised, but it's, it's really continuing the conversation so that Karina can say a bit more about the planning and work that's already taken place around children, adolescents, and youth, because it has been quite substantial. So I want you to hear that, uh, and then I will speak more broadly about the process that's taken us to this point, the internal process within World Vision. And also, between us, we'll make sure that uh, you have a bit more information on the external process, some of which wasn't covered this morning, to make sure you have that. Uh, others were, were, were part of the, the preview. But we'll just make sure we're as clear as we can be on the internal and the external pieces. Okay, so that's the goal for this next session, which is uh, going to last until about 2.30. Uh, okay, so Karina, sorry. Hello. Okay, now it's working. <laughs> we need to wake it up. Not will there some salsa and samba, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think from the beginning, when we started thinking about post-2015, at least in the advocacy community team, we realized that the best, one of the best contributions World Vision could bring to this process is the active engagement and voices of children and youth. Um, for many reasons. First of all, because they have the right to participate. Secondly, because they make up the majority of the population in uh, not only you know, developing countries mainly, but if governments are going to make commitments or renewed commitments to their people, more than half of that people are younger people, are young people. So the intentionality is then to, to bring them uh, you know, uh, and prioritize their voices to influence post-2015 uh, debates and decisions. I have to say that we have been wrestling with the idea of the age brackets, you know, and we are thinking more and more about having a life cycle approach to age. Therefore, we don't divide young people into segments that are not necessarily. When I say life cycle approach, I'm thinking about you know, 0 to 5, 6 to 12, uh, 13 to 16, 18, and then the youth who are, by definition of the UN, 15 to 24, and not, you know, be too normative about how do we engage with youth at different ages. However, having said this, it's not always easy and it's going to be challenging because World Vision is focusing on children and children's... Um, uh, you know, essentials for whatever framework of development is going to come afterwards. But what we are experiencing in our, in our ADPs is the former sponsor kids are now youth. And the youth and the children of today, those who are 13, 14, 15, in 2015 and later will be voters. So we want to have a long-term approach, an intergenerational approach, a more sustainable approach from a human development perspective as well. And those are some of the rationale why it is so important that we engage children and youth. More than that, because World Vision is a grassroots organization, we have our footprint you know, in the grassroots, in the lives of children and youth. It is natural for us just to bring you know, that uh, social force into this <coughs> process. Now, at our preferred approach will be to engage children and youth at the country level. Especially for younger children, the more natural ways in which they engage is at the local community level. As they grow older, you know, they start engaging outside, and we see this in our national offices already. You know, you talk to children's groups and they're more involved in activities in their clubs and networks within their communities and localities. As they grow, they tend to reach out wider. I was in Nepal last week and that was, again, the same story, you know. So we're looking at this uh, uh, in terms of this life cycle approach and preferring their participation and active engagement at the country level when the national consultations will take place. 
We will include the input of children and youth consultations in our policy positions and ask at the national and international level. This is going to be a new frontier for us in World Vision. We have not done this before other than having evidence from the field and incorporating that into our policy asks. We have been debating within the advocacy team on how we take a combination of what we have been doing in terms of policy positions for other campaigns or other efforts we have had and how to include in a more flexible way the input that will come in a more, in a more flexible way, if you will, to, uh, from children and youth into policy asks or policy positions or even communication messages. You know. So that's the new approach we also want to bring to this process. As I said, it's going to be a new frontier. We are going to learn as we go. And it's, it's part of the innovation that we hope this process will allow us to do in a more flexible, more in tune way into how you know, children and youth are participating. We will aim to strengthen children and youth organizations and networks as a result of this process and ensure they will play a key role on holding governments accountable for any resulting commitments. This is something I learned a lot working with the youth in Brazil preparing for Rio. We did not come to Rio saying, oh, there is this global conference, let's prepare the youth to go. We build on the four years of experience of the network of MJPOP on how they were monitoring public policy, how they were mobilizing, how they were working with children and youth. We build on that. They participated in the conference. But even before the conference, they were so effective in spreading the word in the communities that there was something called Rio Plus 20 happening in Rio, where usually most people don't know. This is one lesson learned. And we also started thinking what will happen afterwards. So when we engage in this process, engage in youth and, and children, it is not only for the consultations, etc. We want to build on what is in existence. We have colleagues, thousands of children's networks and youth networks in our ADPs. It's amazing. LACRO uh, recently completed their mapping, and there are hundreds and thousands of groups and networks of children and youth already participating in many ways. So we want to build in those processes and use this opportunity to enhance their capacity, to strengthen their ability to participate, to mobilize, to raise awareness, and to continue later on in a, in a process that will engage them also in holding governments accountable, especially at the local level. We already have children and youth participating in participatory budgets in some countries, in influencing policies, in uh, allocating resources, et cetera, et cetera, at the municipality level and even at the state level. So it's about building on that, leveraging resources and leveraging experience and strengthening those organizations because we're looking at a sustainable citizenship building up you know, capacity process. That's the idea. We are placing a strong emphasis on the voices of children and youth as a way to enhance an equity approach to the process itself. One key element of inequity is exclusion. Exclusion of any type of participation or voice in processes that take place nationally, locally, and internationally. So we believe that World Vision's, one of World Vision's contribution in bringing the voices of children and youth is to bring their voices as a way to also create political processes that are more inclusive to children and youth, especially from the poorest area, the mo most vulnerable groups, to have a word, to have a say. I'm, I'm really amazed of what I'm learning that is happening in our national offices. For example, India has a network of children with disabilities. And UNICEF is scratching their heads on how do we bring the most vulnerable children. We have a reach to them. We, we are close to them. We are, you know, the more we learn about these groups of children and youth that are, have been sort of invisible there, the more we feel that you know, the, the capacity that we have, the, infrastructure, the social infrastructure that we have in place to build from and engage them you know, in the best way we can. I would like just to finish saying that for this work, we are uh, organizing some working groups. I am also thrilled that many of our colleagues working in the field, practitioners, with lots of experience on how do you engage children and youth are part of working groups that we have. We hope to have guidelines for national consultations on child-friendly and youth-friendly ways to engage children and youth 
guidelines for our staff working on how to effectively engage children and youth, guidelines for children or youth when they play a representative role. So we are preparing some of these documents and guidelines as part of our preparation process to support our national offices in their engagement at the national level in, in the consultations that will take place. Finally, I would like to say that we're not doing this from scratch. World Vision already has tools, uh, guidelines, etc., that have been produced that we are tapping into through the Child Wellbeing right and Rights Network, COP, and others. And we are going to build you know, from those uh, materials and tools that have been, de have been developed and adapt them for this particular process. And lastly, there is a parallel process that is more an internal process in World Vision in relation to the Triennial Council. We are building on the regional forums. It was intentional, you know, the planning committee from December last year, we conceptualized how the Triennial Council will have to be the result of the regional forums in the build up of creating awareness and opening spaces for children to participate in the regional forums with board members and with national directors. LACRO had its uh, first regional forum with this frame in mind in, May, in June in Honduras, and it was absolutely amazing. And we're preparing now for Asia, which will take place in India in August, and then uh, Miro, and then Africa. And uh, the first youth conferences that a region is putting together is MIR, the MIR region. They are having uh, two conferences for all their national offices in September to prepare youth to participate in post-2015. And we're also partnering with them to prepare the guidelines and the materials that will uh, be helpful for other regions and other national offices as well. So that's in a nutshell what we are doing. Really um, wanting to hear later on when appropriate at working groups, etc., feedback, input, ideas, questions, because we don't know it all, and we're building as we go with the wisdom and counsel and participation of all our colleagues. So thank you. Thanks, Karina. Um, as Karina referenced there, we will be, one of our working groups is focused specifically on this point, so there'll be a chance for a detailed conversation about this, but I do want to take an opportunity now to, to just to just give you an opportunity for any questions that you have for Karina about this particular area of focus. How are we engaging with partners beyond World Vision? So we're clearly doing a lot of work with youth in our communities and through our regional forums, and training, but partners beyond ourselves. Yes. Uh, within Beyond 2015, there's a small group to focus especially on children and youth engagement. Currently, there are two co-chairs in this small group. Uh, one person, Karen Schroff from Cla Plan International, and Victoria Forsgate from L Restless Development. So this small group has not been very active, I have to say, and we want to enhance you know, their strength. Uh, Victoria is coming to New York next week for this meeting that will take place in the UN. And so that's one s group within Beyond 2015 that we're starting to participate and we want actually to strengthen because it has been a little bit weak. That's one at global level. And the other one is through this interagency of focal youth um, within the UN and the UN Millennium Development Campaign. They are doing the first meeting Monday and Tuesday to start thinking and planning how to engage youth in the way forward uh, on post-2015. Uh, I have been invited to go representing World Vision and Liana will go representing the youth. So that's another area where we hope to learn more what are the plans, also influence, you know, um, what is coming uh, through that path. So those are the two avenues that currently are we are exploring at global level. I'd like to start, I'd like to congratulate Liana and Jose Sergio also for their examples because I caught in both of their presentations uh, the sense that in they're working beyond World Vision's coverage areas. So both of them have examples of working beyond. And my question is that how, as we seek to move this forward, how extensive are our youth networks in the country? Work. Is it primarily in a couple ADPs, or are we seeing 
this happen across our ADPs and beyond the ADPs, and is it taking on a truly national aspect? And is that our objective? It varies uh, from country to country, uh, Dan. In some countries where children, youth uh, and children's networks have been involved with other organizations, for example, to do the shadow reports that go to Geneva for the Convention of the Rights of the Children, children and youth are already participating in networks that are beyond ADPs, some countries. In other countries, they're more contained within ADPs. And so we have a variety, and probably we will have you know, different situations and different scenarios. But as I said before, the older children, they tend to be more autonomous from World Vision, more autonomous from the structure of the ADPs. They tend to engage with other youth, and uh, not only you know, physically or in meetings, but also through online. And so we are seeing that a lot. Um, I, For example, in Latin America, there are already three Facebooks for youth groups. There's one from Brazil, there's one that is emerging from Quito, Ecuador, and then there's another one that brings them together virtually for the 14 countries in Latin America. In Miro, there is a network of that started on child protection issues. It's called the Art Network of Youth, and it's been focused in previous years on trafficking issues, you know, violence, etc. and they come together on their own. They have their own website, so this is, I think, another experience of that we're starting to have as World Vision. Some of the older youth tend to be, as I said, more autonomous. They will have probably some of their own agenda that may not coincide with our own. And this will be another frontier on how do we support that, how do we relate to that, you know? So the idea, as I said before, is to strengthen those groups and networks in this process so that they come out of this consultation or whatever process will take place at the national level more you know, capable, more informed, uh, better skilled at you know, interacting with media, with governments, with other NGOs and negotiating, et cetera, because those are the skills that they're learning. The, w the ways in which we are framing the guidelines today for engaging with children consultation has an interesting component to life skills. You know, so what are the life skills and the, the skills that children and youth will learn as they engage in this process is part of what we would like to achieve. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Karina. This is very, very exciting. And I'm, you know, I'm parachuting in, so anything I say is dangerous and can be used against <laughs> me. So, but I, I, I'm just thinking uh, through this morning that what, what is a bold, hairy, scary idea to kind of throw into this for, for consideration. And the, the first idea that, that com comes to mind is uh, what if uh, we set as a goal, in addition to the very rigorous uh, capacity building process that you're describing, a, a process where, whereby we touch the voice of about three billion youth. And a technology will allow that now. So we'd obviously have to coordinate with the church uh, as much as we could globally coordinate with the Muslim community, as much as we could globally coordinate with our other peer NGOs, but basically a, uh, an elegant but simple uh, kind of survey, about 20 questions that people can put on, that can be distributed, you know, for free through cell phones globally. We could, I, you know, my, my inner sense is we, we could get into the billions uh, in terms of voice, uh, you know, voice, messaging at, 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 for this global 2014 event in Sri Lanka, you know, this youth event. Uh, so I, you know, I, obviously I don't have the, the I could, we could spend an hour on it, the reverse engineering of what that means if that's a, a target date, but just maybe it's already in process, uh, perhaps something similar to that. Thank you, Frank. That is something that beyond 2015, the small group that in, is working on engaging children and youth, we have discussed a lot, and wanting to have the more standardized processes as possible, because um, collecting data and then analyzing data is going to be very challenging if each organization goes with their own, right? So that's one of the principles that we're working around. The other thing is, and this is coming more from uh, our engagement with UNICEF and other NGOs as well, is the UN Millennium Development Campaign is going to organize these global conversations that Falu was talking about this morning. And these, the crowdsourcing um, 
methodology or facility platform has an incredible capacity to organize information around trends of conversations, origin, etc. So we are hoping to be connected to these global conversations by connecting the networks of youth and children that we have. It is my understanding that it will also have language capabilities, so that's a plus to really engage you know, children and youth globally. And so what we will be doing is being the connector you know, to these networks, not necessarily creating a new platform or a new survey, but connecting to those and amplifying those by bringing you know, and connecting to our networks within country and for them to connect networks as well. And um, as I said, it is going to be a new experience. And I have this question in my head. I don't have an answer. How do you translate a crowdsourcing type of data into policy asks or into targets and indicators? Th that's a big question for me. I don't have the answer. I think we will have to wrestle with it. Even internally in World Vision, how are we going to do this is something that we have to debate. And the wisdom of all of us, I think, will help us start getting some answers. Yes. Ready. This will be the last question at this point. <coughs> Listening to Liana and yours, I felt that uh, there are two things like listening to the voices of children and making it possible that these voices are implemented. But I think the way I have listened to them, they were they are little ahead of us in the conceptual framework. Like we are still talking about voices of children to be heard, that level. And I feel that the second level of they putting it practice, making the service providers accountable they have gone further. So probably our framework of the, the must-haves and all need to be a little more progressive to the action. And also I want to see that instead of just events happening at the time of, say for example, in this particular context, uh, post-2015, we should have a kind of a permanent system of a movement of youths and children all over the world, interconnected, working for justice, if there is a system like that, it will be easy to connect and work like Yes, I think definitely that's what we would like to do. Um, there's still a lot for us to think and understand around this dual dimension of what will happen at country level with through the national consultations and what is going to happen globally, right? Uh, for, so for example, if in a country there is a national consultation, that national consultation will take place in a very contextual historical time of that particular country. Whether there are elections, whether there is a new constitution, where, whether they are having a reform. So this process, and we have to be mindful of that in World Vision. When we connect at the national level, we connect in a historical process that is political that is already happening. Whether it's we have a child health now campaign or whether there are processes going on. So at that level, when children and youth participate locally and nationally, there will probably have some policy as that are very concrete for that context. Whether that could be fed into a more aggregate type of global conversation, that's something we still have to see how that will happen in terms of process, right? And how do we, in other processes, connect children and youth globally? That's also another thing that we, we have to um, figure out and, and learn as we go. But I think today we have the means and the technology to be able to, to, to think about this. So anyways, lots of things to talk about, colleagues, and questions, and but new ideas. But thank you so much, and we'll continue. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Karina. Uh, hopefully there'll be a chance, I'm thinking, Sharon, of the Communications for Development approach, which we um, talked about in Nepal as part of this process. And, and uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of important thinking, good thinking going on in that, in your community, in that community around how we marry the new platforms and technologies with uh, these sort of goals. Um, so hopefully we can hear more about that in the smaller groups, yeah, yeah. It is, you know, when I hear, Rennie, your comments and Frank and others who are uh, really talking about innovative approaches to uh, to how we engage, it. it um, I mean, it, it, I find it quite inspiring, and it also 
poses the challenge of how, I mean, World Vision is not among our many strengths. <laughs> Innovation doesn't often come up at the top of our list of strengths. And this sort of process is one that's going to really push us. And I mean in, within advocacy, within integrated ministries, within global capitals, within communications, everywhere. This is something that really challenges us. Um, but hopefully, um, with the work that we're doing through the Triennial Council, where there's a lot of energy and, and expectation, and through this kind of process, we will come to a new place of engaging youth um, with, with greater legitimacy and greater creativity and um, leadership and participation of youth. So I'm very hopeful and excited about that and uh, somewhat daunted, but uh, it's, it's um, I think as you'll, you'll be picking up through this two days, this focus on children and youth is what is bubbling up as the core of what, what it is that we have to bring to this process that is important. And I, I, I don't want to say unique, because others, of course, focus on youth. But it is one of our value-added uh, value added areas that we are really looking at as the, at the core of our approach to this process. So thanks, Karina, for, for all of your leadership on this, um, on this area. And we'll, again, come back to this in the, in the, in the specific conversation that we'll have uh, later on. I'm going to um, take us back, in a sense, to I, I want to ensure that we have as much clarity as we can on the external process. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because as some of us are talking over, the, over the, the lunch, one of the things that was clear from this morning is that there are a lot of question marks in the process. There's no one at the secretary, in the Secretary General's office in UNDP and UNICEF who knows the full process at this state. There's a lot of question marks. So we should try to get comfortable with that in a certain sense um, and not uh, try to understand everything. But let's make sure we do understand what, what we can at this stage at least. We covered most of these areas this morning. We really covered all three of these, these pieces this morning that we hope to be involved in. Uh, these are three core pieces of the process that we discussed. I think just, just to add to what we heard this morning was as we look at this, on the, starting with the national cons consultations, there is a list of 50 countries that has been proposed. Um, it was noted, uh, Richard mentioned this morning that that list could be expanded. Some, some of those countries could be developed countries, donors and so on, which is a good thing. Uh, but there is a current list that we've, we've looked at. We have a presence in 34 of those 50 countries. And we have started through consultation with regional offices. We've started to prioritize which of those countries we think would be most valuable for us to engage in or more, most possible for us to engage in. Uh, so we've come up with a list of, of 10 uh, with a few potential additional ones. And there we're, we're hoping to, um, with Karina's team leading and with some additional resources being added to that, and I think resources is a key question in, in terms of how we're going to do this, we are, we are hoping and expecting to, in, to have 10 World Vision offices participate in the process at the national level. On the thematic side, uh, to Richard Morgan's point this morning, to his response to my question, how do we best engage, we will need to focus at some level. If we are going to, if we're going to engage with the nine thematic consultations, and he said there may be 11, there may be 12, but there's nine listed right now. Uh, at, the, at the advocacy team level, we uh, also took, took to heart the need to focus on some of the areas where we feel we have the most uh, to contribute. And so we've come up with a, a initial recommendation, a recommendation that we focus on those groups that look at conflict and fragility, health, food security and nutrition, and inequality. Those are four groups. Um, we need, to, we need to, to talk about that, to debate that. Uh, it's hard to to give up on some of the other ones where we have something to say as well. But I think in some ways the, the point is that we do need to focus on only a few of those thematic groups if we're going to have an impact and be able to say something that's meaningful. 
we heard about the global conversation this morning to some degree, and we are also connected to that. Andrew Hassett, who's the director of our global health campaign, child health campaign, is connected to, uh, to the key outreach group that's focusing on citizen engagement. And so we also have a, a stake in that process. We need to look at the kind of ideas that Frank is suggesting for you know how would we how would we connect our global networks to a wider um, a wider conversation that could bring millions or billions of people involved in the conversation of what should be in this new framework. Yeah, just to interact, interject. You know, I was amazed that one of the nine themes wasn't what technology is doing to all of us. There'll be 20 billion com computers in the world in 2020. 20 billion. It's redefining middle class life. It's going to redefine the emerging, surging middle class in developing countries, what we all do with our time. I'm not a technologist or a futurist, but it's like the biggest thing in the room in uh, cross cutting and, you know, not like I said, I don't own stock in Microsoft or anything, but it's, uh, it's a hugely uh, kind of prominent and profound topic that. We don't know is kind of the, what what it's what it's going to going to be doing to us. So just throw that out as a an observation based on the nine themes that were presented. In response to that, it does come up in most of the nine papers. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've read seven, six, so that's up the next. Okay. I'm just distributing a a, a a chart which seeks to um, a diagram which seeks to give clarity in a, in a visual form to the post-2015 process. And if you, I believe this was in one of the pre-reads. So if you did your pre-read homework, you would have seen this. This is a, a diagram that was developed by Amy Pollard, who's going to be joining us tomorrow from CAFOD, one of the leading uh, CSO thinkers on the post-2015 process. And again, this seeks to, to try to bring clarity to the various levels of, of engagement that, uh, and processes that are, that are part of this. So let's just walk through this quickly and see if this also brings further clarity to, to us all. It's probably hard to read, and even on the, the printout, it's, it's rather small type. Uh, so if we start at the bottom, well, first of all, to note that the timeline, so running from the beginning of 2012 right through to 2016, January 1st, which is when the MDGs run out. If we start at the bottom in the, on the green arrow, this is the, um, the importance of emphasizing that we need to continue with the commitment to uh, achieve the original MDGs. And this is an important message for us in World Vision that we have to say, almost every time we say something publicly, I think about post-2015, we need to remind ourselves and remind our supporters and remind our publics that we're not giving up on the MDGs, that we are continuing to fight for their, uh, for their achievement in many different ways. That is, after all, what Child Health Now is built around is two, two of those MDGs at least. So we will continue to work towards that and that, that's certainly clarified in this, in this diagram. The next arrow up is, is talking about that global conversation the work that the Millennium, UN Millennium Campaign is leading, which will flow right through the process um, to engage global citizens in this, to bring those voices forward. So running right through uh, from now until uh, really to towards the end of the process, we think. Then the next two arrows point out what we've talked about, the thematic consultations and the, the country-based consultations. The time frame here is um, listed through February, January, February of next year. And th even this morning, I think Richard or um, one of the other uh, panelists noted a different time frame. So that's, that's in flux. We're still not sure exactly. Well, it, the thematics have already started, but we're still waiting for clarity on when many of the other thematics are going to be beginning and when the country consultations will run. But in any case, that's running between now and sometime in the first or second quarter of 2013. Moving up, staying in the current timeline, um, is the UN high-level panel uh, 
the UN High Level Panel, uh, which is coming together. So as we've heard tomorrow, we we're expecting to hear the announcement on who will be in that panel. I should say here that we have been working on trying to ensure that there is CSO involvement in that panel. And in fact, uh, through the Berlin Civil Society um, Center, uh, which, which involves Kevin Jenkins directly and Barris Gwynn from, from Geneva, we, uh, we were, Kevin, Kevin Jenkins' involvement in, as a potential CSO rep on the panel was endorsed along with others, uh, other CSO members. So we have been pursuing the possibility of having Kevin part of the CSO representation on that panel. In any case, we know at this point that we have three co-chairs from Liberia, Indonesia, and the UK, and that that panel will be, we think, announced tomorrow, um, if not later on today, tomorrow. So that will be an important uh, process. We, we will be attending at least virtually that meeting, but potentially in person to make sure that we get the intelligence coming right back, the information coming right back to this meeting on what, what occurs there. That, that panel, and, and I look to others to, to uh, confirm this, I mean, that panel is creating political support, political backing for this project, ensuring that at a high level um, we're, we're, we're developing the support that we need globally, politically, to ensure that we're successful through this process, which is why the Secretary General went after high level um, co-chairs to, to take this through and, and co-chairs from around the globe to take us through that. Um, moving up, th uh, I'm just going to jump up to the, the SDG process which was noted today as well. And this is one where frankly I have, even though I've been in the, in the center of this discussion for a long time, I still am challenged. I keep asking Arellis, Arellis explain again to me how the SDGs and the MDGs are going to come together. Uh, as we heard this morning, in some ways we don't really know. Uh, we know that the, the SDGs process will be uh, beginning in earnest really now, but starting from the September UNGA. Uh, they came out of the Rio plus 20 process. They were, they were agreed by member states, by the, the uh, member state representatives at Rio plus 20. And so there will be some sort of parallel process along the lines of the, the post-2015 process that will go right through till September of 2013. So for that first year, at least, these will be separate processes with a lot of overlapping agendas, uh, but they will be separate. Then they will, in some way, come together uh, September 2013. Um, we don't know exactly how that will look, and we. I think we, in some ways, aren't even clear about our own position on how they, how they should come together or not. It's a difficult question. It has to do with, the SDGs are, of course, more than development goals. They're more than responsibilities for developing countries or for donors. It's about um, responsibilities uh, of every country in the world to those goals. So it's, it's, it's quite a different framework and politically the MDGs, the post-MDG process is very, very challenging. The SDGs, in my mind, are even more difficult um, because uh, if I think of my own country, Canada, trying to get my government to agree to goals that have to do with carbon uh, consumption and things like that is pretty difficult, to, to say the least, right now. So how will the world come together around these goals, of course, is a big question. So those are, those are a number of the main components that are leading us over the course of this next year. We need to recall, let me, let me just step back again, in terms of the post-2015 process, what will be delivered in September of 2013 is not the new framework. It will be a report from the Secretary General, which should give us the parameters. It, 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 will, it will lead the debate, basically. From next September, uh, that is when, a few months later perhaps, in 2014, that's when the political debate begins among nation states, among member states of the UN, to, to create that new framework, we expect. So there are a number of steps in the process that we need to keep in mind when we think about how should World Vision engage 
in this first piece? How should World Vision engage in the SDG process in the first piece? How should we kind of resource up for those different stages? When should we be bringing the, the, the global voices, the voices of children, the voices of our communities into this process? When should we be campaigning? When should we be focusing on government relations? These are the kind of questions that we need to bring to mind when we look at this, um, when we look at this process from now right through till 2016. So let me stop there, and, I, and I, I'm looking around to, to Amanda, to Arellas, to Karina, and, and others, uh, to, to, to all of us who have been quite engaged in this understanding the process and looking to see how World Vision should be engaged. And just, uh, you, you, th I'm sure there are some gaps in terms of the information that I have, I have shared here, but do you want to add anything in terms of um, what we need to know, what we need to, the people around this circle need to, to know, to understand about the, the post 2015 process, the SDGs, and so on. Okay, um, I think um, just, um, the only thing that I just, just like to emphasize, which you already mentioned it, is that uh, the different stages of the of the process, and because of those uh, that different stages is that you see in the diagram uh, some arrows that take us up until September 2013. So our race now is going up until September 2013. That's like the immediate task that we have. And uh, the longer arrows is the ones that take us to, to the remainder of the process, which is the most substantive aspect of the, of the process because that's the portion where we are going to be actually developing uh, the next agenda. So I think that's, that's the most important thing that we have to be very clear about um, because this has implication for the engagement that we define, the time frame that we define for our engagements. What I would like to add is, um, I think the post-2015, because it's a UN-led process, and SDGs, because it's an intergovernmental process, these are going to be two political processes that are very different. And we need to think about, especially the SDGs, in the context of shifting powers in the world and the emergence of the BRICS and other bodies um, because it's going to be different, because of the role they're starting to play. Uh, it is my understanding, and Rennie can confirm this, for example, that India is already developing its position on SDGs. So because it's, it's government-owned, it is going to be different from the UN-led processes. And I think this distinction is extremely important for us to understand because that's where the political tensions and even defining our own position as World Vision as a global organization is going to be challenged. Um, we already see, for example, in the Security Council, the position related to Syria. China and Russia have a completely different approach than the traditional Western ways of approaching violence in a country, and they have stopped interventions. What is that telling us in terms of how the new powers are going to behave and lead this process moving forward of the SDGs? Uh, for me, that's an area that is going to require some more political savvy from us and how to um, define our messages and our, you know, our positions because of, of this change in the shift in powers that is really uh, impacting the political arena. And um, <coughs> so the earlier we can start understanding the positions that governments are having on SDGs, the better. Tomorrow we will have a panel with diplomatic representatives. I think that's an excellent opportunity for us to get to know better. What are the new, you know, these uh, governments thinking? How are they engaging? What are they going to see coming out through this process? Also because ultimately, when the UN brings together the heads of state to make any commitment, how are these two processes going to interact? I think those are some of the questions and reflections that I started to have as I see these two processes evolving. And as I said, it will require also for us in World Vision to have a very sophisticated way to interact field and global teams. 
because of what is going to happen at country level, especially in the countries that are in the lead up to the SDGs and how they are going to move that in their country and internationally. So it will require a very sophisticated interaction between us understanding here the diplomatic missions and the countries with the respective governments on that, how that process is going to evolve. That's some reflection that I have. Okay. I, don't need, I hope my voice is big enough that I don't need a microphone. Um, one thing that I find most, uh, let's say, uh, on one and hopeful, on the other hand, uh, a source of concern is this high-level panel. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the people who have been selected already, David Cameron, Mr. What's his name? Yudo uh, Yono, the president of in uh, the yeah, president of Indonesia, and Alan Johnson, Sir Leave. Very uh, impressive people. But what is their personal political agenda when they accept this nomination? Because they have a political personal agenda. And to what extent will that personal political agenda influence the outcome of this high level panel? I think it's time for us to start worrying about that. And the other thing that I find a little bit concerning is that in that high level panel, there is no visible representation the one country that could make or break the whole process, that's the United States. So I'm wondering what Adam <laughs> thinks about that. Uh, so, yeah, and you mentioned that it's, it's a laudable initiative, of course, of World Vision, to try through the Berlin Civil Society Center to get Kevin Jenkins part of that panel. There are There is no shortage of candidates. And there was already, uh, uh, beyond 2015, already uh, created a huge list, uh, and we all had to fill in why we want certain candidates, etc., and ultimately that has been narrowed down to three or four civil society candidates, of which how many are going to be actually admitted? That's a big question mark. And and even there, you know, you could question uh, what kind of balance they're going to strike between north and south and east and the west. So, to be very honest, I'm not very optimistic about the chances for Kevin James to be part of that panel. I'm, I'm great that we try, but a, a larger coalition than just World Vision has already put forward some, some candidates. But I think the first question is much more, uh, 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 I would say, relevant <coughs> is what is the political agenda of these high-level political leaders that are co-chairing this, this high-level panel? And how, the, how will that pan out in the ultimate outcomes? Sorry, just two comments. One on getting Kevin Jenkins on the panel. Just as a comment, I think it was always seen as a long shot, but from New York it's actually proven quite a useful way to get access to a lot of the UN representatives here who we met with and spoke to about this opportunity. And really the, the main outcome is that they now know what Vision is focused and working on the post-2015 agenda. So it's a side outcome, but it was a, an opportunity to get access. So it's had some, even if Kevin doesn't get up, which I think is given. Um, it was useful as an exercise anyway. But the one thing I also wanted to add um, on Aurelis' point about the long arrows and the short arrows, I think it's really important <coughs> our trying to formulate well, what, what is World Vision's role in this. Even though the next 12 months is really informing what, cause if, what will the UN recommend, the framework looks like, what will the Secretary General recommend, and that sort of would suggest your priority would be the thematic areas and what's our policy input. Knowing how long it takes World Vision to really deliver on the grounds um, advocacy and build the capacity we need to influence government. But the period beyond that to September 2015, we need to be thinking about that now. That if we're really to be effective as political players come September 2015, that end point on the final framework, um, that, that work has to be in now as well. It can't just be trying to inform the UN framework if we're going to be effective in 2015. One of the So one of the things is I think it's interesting in terms of starting the planning, if we have this, is to be uh, really clear in this, in this meeting of today's of which are the best timing to get involved and which are the strengths of our visions in each area. Because we not might be able to do all those areas. We might not be able to be a leadership, have a leadership in each of these uh, panels. However, we can pick some of them and some spe specific moments when we can make a change. And I think if we broader and focus on that, 
we might be able to have like like small changes little by li little by li little. <laughs> Lots of lots of points here. I had Adam, um, James, and Ben. So, a question and a comment, and I don't want to get ahead of the agenda, but it seems like there's different pressure points that we need to focus on. There's, and I'd be curious what your and other others' reflections of the post 2015 coalition are. Because it seems like in the next 12 months, it's going to be crucial to influence this high-level panel around those broad parameters for the Millennium Development Goals. Because in some ways, that might end up setting the high watermark in terms of what's possible. And if that panel sets parameters that are too modest, that are too weak, that aren't ambitious enough, the entire process gets derailed. And ultimately, we can have lots of input in the thematic areas that those thematic areas won't really have teeth unless the parameters are pretty strong. So I agree that we need to have kind of a dual track approach of you know, between now and 2013 and then beyond, but I think this next 12 months is really crucial. And I want us to be a real player in setting you know, a pretty ambitious set of expectations on what we want to see happen in that. And we can't do it single-handedly, so question becomes what coalitions are most effective and are most relevant. And then kind of my, my other set of thoughts or, or questions are around how do we align some of what we're doing with our engagement in the G20 in particular, and this kind of ties into Karina's uh, comment. I think there's a real opportunity with Australia hosting the G20 in two years for us to try to empower the Australian government to be a real leader and champion. And certainly, you know, given our influence there, but also just the general trend in Australia, I think there's lots of potential there. And I think with the new president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, who's got a very kind of different background than previous presidents, there's a chance for the World Bank to really play a constructive role in this development of a new post-energy framework than a fairly kind of unhelpful role that the World Bank and IMF played in the previous version or the existing version. So those are at least two pressure points that I think we should really map out and put into our overall equation because I think it could be very crucial. <coughs> to say more about this. I think we, we've been, um, as we've looked at this within advocacy and, and looked at the country consultations as a key opportunity for us to lead, we've noted that if we're going to do that, if we have any chance of doing that, that we're going to have to bring some resources into the process to support, um, to support the engagement at the country level. So Karina, do you want to say a bit about what the what our initial planning is around that? 
the first step for us was to develop a resource pack, and Amanda has been instrumental in working on a resource pack that we're almost finished doing. We engaged some colleagues from the field in an initial stage to give feedback into the resource pack, whether it had the information that was helpful, you know, it had gaps, what could be uh, more helpful there. We're linking that resource pack to the advocacy learning library where we have different tools to engage in uh, advocacy type of uh, activities. So we'll publish that resource pack. That's just the first step, and we hope to have it at least in three languages also, because otherwise we left out uh, West Africa and Latin America. So it will be in Spanish and French. Outside of that, what we've, we started thinking is that we'll probably, out of the countries that will be participating, to form uh, something like a community of practice, not with a structure that currently we have, but a community of learning and sharing experiences as we go, where you know there will be a need for an interactive mechanism where there is information from what's happening globally to go to national offices, but also to hear from what is happening at national level to the global you know, scheme. So that's something we have to uh, develop still. And uh, during the working groups, ideas and uh, other um, advice will be really helpful. But moving forward, this is something we have been thinking. We have been thinking about regular town halls, for example, to keep people informed and listening and interacting and giving input into different processes. Uh, and so it is going to be a very interactive process as we move forward. And we need to put together the structures and the mechanisms that will help this, in this interaction and the flow of information and intelligence to take place. So something to uh, be developed and worked out as we move forward. Sorry, just like while we're on the capacity building, I guess it's only just occurred to me now that like, uh, we, we often talk about the needs at the national level for capacity um, in, in a political engagement sense of government relations. But in this work, we're probably also going to come up against capacity constraints in, for instance, engaging the high-level panel and seeking to influence at that level. There's lots of people who do that in our global capitals, but um, that it's possibly that we also have to think about how do we really build our capacity for that, for that sort of engagement as well. Well, my question was was related to this. I think it's just kind of a bit hard. But you mentioned in your presentation that of 34 countries where World Vision has presence in this initial list, 50 will be targeting 10. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Why 10 versus 34? Uh, are you sharing what 10 they are? What is the strategy around them? You know, in you know the way World Vision works today, we had to have conversations with global field operations in terms of how to engage with that world. One of the initial recommendations of global field operations to, was to have an opt-in approach. In other words, not to say to national offices you have to engage, but do you want to engage? This is something that is happening in the external landscape. It's not something that World Vision has invented, and therefore national offices will have to decide what type of engagement, what capacity for engagement do they have, right? So initially there was this opt-in, but then uh, we continue our discussions and thinking that there, if there is going to be some uh, support that will have to be more targeted, we couldn't do it with 34 countries you know, globally. We would not have that capacity. So the idea was to nail down 10 countries where for different reasons there are Opportunities, there's more capacity, and they're also strategic to engage. And we started consultations with our advocacy leads in regional offices to you know, see their priorities, etc., etc. So I think we can share the list of countries uh, that we have come up with and you know, the, the different rationale behind uh, why to choose these countries. Some of the countries, most of them actually are countries where we have child health now. Uh, not only because we have invested in building capacity in those countries, but also because that natural linkage of the MDGs with what will come after the post MDGs is very important. And so South Sea Asian countries, some countries that are G20 countries in the developing world, some countries that are, um, for, for example, Indonesia is very important because the president of Indonesia is part of the high-level panel. 
we don't have an office in Liberia anymore, unfortunately, so that was not possible. But the, that was sort of the rationale behind why to choose certain countries and you know, the list that came out later on. So right now, I guess we're still trying to decide with senior leaders, you know, whether, okay, there will be some countries where possibly there could be more support, but we don't want to not uh, say that other national offices who are willing to participate, who feel that they have the capacity to engage, are also, you know, free to engage in the process, but that's something, you know, we're uh, discussing with senior leaders at this point. It, it, it always comes to capacity, funding, you know, those kinds of things, and what already national offices have in their place. I'll see if I remember. Um, okay, in, I can remember in Mir, it's Armenia. Actually, it's very active right now, our national office there. In uh, Asia, it's India, Indonesia. I think those are the two countries. In uh, Africa, we have Senegal in West Africa, uh, Uganda, Kenya, South Africa, um, DRC, thank you, DRC, because we also wanted to have a fragile contact, you know, country. In Latin America, it's Brazil, it's Colombia. Colombia actually was the government that put forward the SDGs. Um, so Colombia, Brazil, Peru, um, I think uh, Bolivia, because we have CHN there also, and uh, I think Honduras is the other one. So those are more than 10, yeah, because we had 10, and then we also put some alternatives, like two or more, so Honduras is an alternative. Uh, Mir wants to do this in Pakistan as well, which is the other selected country, but you know, we didn't select it within the 10, but if they want to go ahead, they'll, they probably are going to do it, you know, so. We want them to participate, but it was also a suggestion from the advocacy regional person. So it's that conversation going on right now. Okay. Um, I, I would think um, that there needs to be very careful consideration about the ability of the DRC to take on yet another piece of work. I think they're already overwhelmed and we're seeing right now how long it's taken to get off the ground even the FCBM model there. So I'm just expressing a little bit of concern because I'm intimately aware of the situation on the ground. And it's, I, I think it's really important for us to have a fragile state. I mean, Pakistan is a fragile state if they're, and they have a very solid advocacy team there. Uh, South Sudan is a fragile state. We are building capacity there. But I think within DRC, there are so many projects that we would like to see go on already, so many things starting. I'm just not very confident that we will just get the results that we need, but we will put the national office under a lot of pressure to deliver under circumstances that might be a little bit hard. Thank so you, I think that's an important consideration. The question of resourcing 10 countries, five countries, 12 countries is a very significant one and it will need to come into our deeper discussions within the, the working groups because the practicalities of how we do this. We need to take the learnings from our experience with CHN, Kate shaking her head, uh, into this. Um, maybe, our, maybe our hopes and dreams as well, but we need to take the practical learnings from what CHN has taught us about how we engage at the country level uh, into this, so that we know what resources are needed practically to, to make this happen. I do want to tie this together because I'm, I'm taking, I'm biting into Mel's time and. Mel is uh, much more senior than I am, so I don't want to get her <laughs> mad at me. But, um, but we had Denise some time ago who was wanting to get in, and then we have some second, second questions. Denise. Well, first comment on the, on, the, on the national consultations, I think it's going to be good. I just wondered um, if you also thought, I imagine they were taught tidying somehow with the UN stimulated national level consultations in some form or fashion. So the timing of those consultations would matter in the way that we do our own consultations. That was just a, a comment. My question has to do with um, the, the, in terms of strategizing around this. 
um, some more clarity as to what the PRC's expectations are, um, because I would imagine there was a reason why they gave AJC this task and what they wanted to see come out of it. That, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know if I have, uh, I can speculate, but I wasn't uh, intimately involved in that conversation with the PRC. I don't know if anyone else uh, Charles would have been much more connected to that. Um, beyond the, in some ways, the obvious that this is an external engagement process that it makes sense for advocacy to be leading on, um, I'm not sure if they really articulated their, their full expectations, just that we needed to lead. And if, if I reflect, maybe in a way of answering your question, if I reflect on what's been happening since then, We've been in a, a really a, a continuous dialogue with senior World Vision leaders. So Dirk Boy, Dave Young, uh, Ken Casey, and others who, uh, through Charles, who uh, have been asking us a lot of tough questions about what this, the importance of this process. What do you need to engage, what does it mean for us to be involved in 10 to 12 countries? Why do you need someone from integrated ministries to be here and, and who else should have been, you know, should be here? So th there's a lot of questions about the understanding the value of the process. How, how will this impact the child at the, country, at the community level? Those typical World Vision questions that we get asked all the time about the value of advocacy. But I would say that there is, in my uh, estimation, there is a an upward trajectory of understanding and uh, expectation that, and understanding that this is a process that we must be involved in, that we must be a leader in as an organization that connects deeply with our child well-being goals, connects deeply with our ambitions to touch 150 million children by 2016. So as I read it, and increasingly our senior leaders understand why we need to be involved. They still want to know how, and they want to know how the resources will be used. Um, they want to know how many times we're going to ask Jai Kumar and Rudo to, to go to global meetings. But um, they are opening, they're giving Charles the political, internal political room that, that he needs to, to do this, for one thing. I mean, we, one of the reasons why this meeting why the invitation to this meeting didn't come to you until three weeks ago or a month ago was because we were still gaining that internal political support to actually do this. There are other reasons as well, but that was one of the main reasons. So we're, we're in an internal uh, dialogue, but again, I think we're, we're going forward and we're going, we have strong support, stronger and, and growing support among senior leaders to, to engage. I hope that's, Karina, others, I hope that's a fair representation. I think that's certainly what we're hearing through Charles, yeah. Okay, th this has been really, really good, really good questions and great feedback, which is why I didn't, this is what we're here for, um, to, to, to develop this clarity and to, there's lots of other hard questions out there I know that people are just waiting to, to find the right time to, to put on the table. Um, but these have been really, really good questions and hopefully, sort of reading your faces, hopefully you're starting to see more of the, of the opportunity and more clarity about how we will um, participate in this process. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say, if just for, a f I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can here, because again, I'm eating seriously into other, other agendas here. But I, I do want you to have a fuller picture of how we have come to this point. And again, if you, if you did spend time with the pre-reads, you've seen some of this. And if you attended the town hall meeting or meetings, you would have heard about this. But I want to make sure that you do know that this isn't the starting point. This meeting is not the starting point. In fact, one of the things that, I, I can say this because I had nothing to do with it, uh, but there was some significant foresight among uh, senior leaders in advocacy and perhaps in other teams as well that knew this was coming, that saw already 18 months ago, two years ago, that this process is coming and we better start getting ready for it. I would put Kirsty Nolan among that group. Um, others were, were part of that as well. 
uh, I'm sure some of you in this room were saying we need to start to to get our think get our thoughts together on how we're going to engage. So hopefully you read the the thought piece reaching the MDGs 2.0 really, really quality piece of work that was done to help set up the organization very early. Um, an example of World Vision being ahead of the process. Tomorrow we're going we're gonna to hear from Jan with a long Dutch name, <laughs> who, if, again, if you read his paper, one of the, the co-authors of the MDGs themselves, who cites World Vision's paper in his own document. So we, we were ahead of the game in terms of thinking about the politics of, of the post-NDGs, post-2015 process. So, so that was certainly one of the, the important pieces on the, on the way. Um, I've already noted the internal political support that we've been working on and continuing to gain through this process, gaining PRC support uh, for investing some resources into this. Of course, uh, you're going to hear in a little while from Marius, who's going to talk about the, our work with Beyond 2015. Uh, uh, there's other, others of us who are involved in that as well, of course, as a global movement. But that's been a significant part of our initial work. And I, I think it needs to be clear, if it hasn't been already, that engaging through global coalitions is going to be essential to our success, to the broader our success as well. Uh, we, I've also mentioned that Andrew is part of this UN Millennium Campaign citizen engagement process. Uh, so that's another piece that we're, we're connecting with. In terms of resources, other resources that we've developed, Karina already mentioned the resource pack that Amanda and Karina and others have been working towards. We're hoping to finalize that ASAP so that can be ready for those national offices that, that choose to engage at the country consultation level. Karina has talked about the, chil the, the child, adolescent, and youth focus and, and the working group that started to uh, develop around that. We've drafted an initial must-haves for children document. Uh, beyond 2015, developed a must-haves post-2015 document, and we sort of borrowed from that idea to develop an initial draft around what we think are the must-haves in this process for children. It's still in draft form. It's been re revamped a couple of times now, and so hopefully we'll be able to share that with this community soon. Uh, but that's another way for us to focus our own internal thinking and also hopefully be something of a thought leader uh, or in certainly engaged in the process in putting out our ideas. Hopefully sometimes before they're even fully shaped or fully certain, uh, which is something that World Vision has a hard time doing, right? Feeding into the process before we're really, really 100% certain that we mean it. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do through this process. Sharon and her team together with others has uh, developed a draft communication strategy, uh, which hopefully we'll have some chance to hear more about as well. And then uh, we've been working on an overall strategic framework and, r and roadmap, which we want to, to have your endorsement uh, for by the end of uh, your, your recommendations for and endorsement of an overall strategic framework by the end of this two days. Let me, as quickly as I can, uh, talk about the uh, recommendations, the, the decisions that, were, that came out of the Nepal meeting of the management team of advocacy and justice for children last week, uh, because I think this is important background as well. I've said to a few of you here that we went into that meeting 10 days ago in Nepal with already an understanding, a commitment to make post-2015 a priority. But in that meeting itself, there was something of a, of a spark um, which went off um, certainly in Charles's mind and heart and among others as well, which was a realization that if we're really going to be serious about this process, that we need to make this a significant priority for the team going forward. Um, so that was uh, a, a clear uh, conclusion of that meeting that alongside of CHN we need to make the post 2015 process for the next three years one of the top priorities for uh, for the for ANJC for advocacy at the global capital level global center level and our hope is that we will be able to uh, to bring along with that um, commitment 
other entities around the partnership to make this a, a high priority as well. Uh, so there will be some significant arm twisting in between meetings here uh, among, uh, between uh, some of us and, and some of you to, uh, to encourage your, your support for that. We did, uh, the management team last week did endorse a process which would involve us at all levels in the UN process with a focus, as we've discussed, on certain countries and certain of the thematic goals, but a sense that we do need to be involved in all of those major aspects of the UN process. And that our role, uh, a good part of our role is coordinating partnership participation. It's, it should be obvious, and, and, and I'll, I'll certainly say it, that this is, not, um, this is not an advocacy project. This is a project that needs a program or a initiative, I won't say campaign, but this is, a, this is a project that requires the involvement of all aspects of World Vision, global capitals, integrating ministries, support offices, national offices, regional offices. This goes much beyond Charles's team. Um, so it needs to be seen as a project, we hope, that requires the participation of the full partnership. And that's certainly what we'll be looking for. Uh, these other pieces, I think, have been, have been mentioned. I, I will note that we are wanting to bring some resources to the process that, that connect to corporate engagement. We, one of the things that was so different about Rio Plus 20 from 1992 was that CSOs were involved at the center almost, and corporations were involved at the center. That didn't happen in 1992. Um, and so for good and for ill, um, corporate corporations are, are and need to be part of this dialogue together with governance, together with CSOs. And so we want to, to use some of the resources that we have within ANJC and within the partnership to engage corporations around this. This could be for big ideas like the one that Frank suggested, um, but it's also about holding corporations accountable to how they will contribute to the achievement of the MDGs themselves, but also the new framework. So those are some of the, the key pieces that, that um, we came out of the, the management team meeting, the, the advocacy team meetings last week, that we saw central to the strategy that we needed to bring forward. Uh, so I just wanted to, 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 to give you that flavor of uh, some of the thoughts and decisions that came out of that. I'll just stop there for a moment and, and ask you if you have any questions for clarity about, about that. Yeah. yeah, just my quick reaction to the framework. Very nice. I would like to see a strong coordination between support offices. That's an objective Thinking back to the Child Health Now, for example, in the early days, you'll remember Chris, I think, in the very early days of Child Health Now, one of the strongest catalyzing factors was the support office meetings that we had in DC at a time. And that really gave the energy for the Canada team and the big team to affect not just the bilaterals but the national offices and that kind of energy. Um, not to be predictable. Um, the campaign, the Child Health Now campaign is going to be measured this year in November when we come together as a partnership around one global moment. I haven't seen that mentioned as much as I'd like to in the documents I've seen. I'm just thinking that how we bring those two things together and how we allow the space for the global week of action within this context and we don't distract and over overload people. I'm just really concerned about it. You can be sure that Andrew brought this this question to the table last week. Andrew Hassett, the director of, the, of CHN, this question and concern about should we bring post-2015 into the Global Week of Action? Um, how would that look? Uh, would that distract? Would that confuse? I mean, the overall answer was yes. We didn't quite see, but I know, I know Sharon and Andrew are working on a way of starting to, to turn, in a sense, our messaging in the Global Week of Action in a way that opens up the conversation for post-2015. So we have some initial thinking about how we can do that without distracting those offices who are involved from what they understand to be the purpose of that, that week. 
So, valid point. Uh, Mel and well, uh, just, just to this exact point, um, like every good Australian, I've actually changed the question that you gave me <laughs> <laughs> for the next session. So I'm going to do a little bit of what you asked me to do, which was a stop take on the MDGs. Yeah. But as I've listened to this conversation, I actually think one of the critical questions for us to grapple with is how do we not lose sight of the focus on the current MDGs, whilst, which takes me to Child Health Now, whilst morphing into what comes next? And I just think that's a critical question for the organisation, and I don't think we can... I actually think we need to get some answers out of this room before we leave because I think it'll be quite confused otherwise. So I can do a stop take and I'm happy to do that as to where we've got to on the MDGs and what lessons do we think we've learned and all that kind of stuff. It'll take the two or three minutes that you gave me. But then I think it would be really constructive to have, and the question I rose, how do we ensure we stay focused on the achievements of the MDGs, particularly four and five, whilst we begin to refocus on the... So I actually think it would be a useful conversation to have this part of the session I was going to okay. engage in. If you're happy for Australia to change the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. No, it's, it's a very relevant point, and we need, to, we need to have a clear message around that, especially in relation to health. So you've already, you've already presaged the, the discussion. Let's just, I know there are a couple of other questions, and then we'll move into that session, Mel, right away, with a bit of stretch break. Arellis, uh, sorry, Arellis had a... Just one second. Go back to the previous slides. Okay, in the last uh, where it says participation in all levels as part of the strategic framework um, of all levels of your process goal of securing a new ambitious global framework. But it just comes to my mind that as you all know, the UN it's all about language. And uh, with uh, this uh, post-2015 um, framework, um, there are different scenarios that have been put on the table. Some of them were mentioned by our, our panelists this morning. Uh, do we accept one, one of the scenarios is do we extend the, the current MDGs? Uh, do we re-energize them to incorporate the new global landscape? So there are different scenarios. So when we're saying secure, secure a new global framework, it has a political implication because that means that World Vision, the position that World Vision is taking is that we want close down the MDGs and grab a whole new framework. So my question is, have we arrived to that decision? Have we arrived to that um, political thinking? Because uh, you know, for advocacy and for engage, external engagement, that will be very key if we are going to be talking about a new ambitious global framework. The ambitious are completely fine with that. <laughs> um, but if the new is the one that I am a little bit Concern whether we are right to that decision. And I would say we, we have not. I think it's. it's I think it's, we actually have had, like, in some of the discussions, sometimes in the drafts, we see the word enhance instead of new. And it's actual discussion that is a good point because otherwise it just sort of happens through drafting that we change our positions significantly. But um, I think in some briefs I've seen the words and enhance <coughs> features. So it doesn't disregard the possibility of the we maybe incorporate that in the Mel Melanie's <laughs> session? It's a big question, but I feel yeah. like it's a crucial one. Yes. Take that on. Okay. That sounds interesting. We already have more or less 10 countries. And if we already got the idea of Kate to get uh, the link between the CHN campaign and the, and the MDGs discussion, we might be on the second uh, on the second step to discuss we are we, which could be the involvement of the national office and in terms of the support ones, if we're going to support uh, like like regionally some of them in terms of participation, what could be the responsibility of each of us in in, in this construction because if we are already here and we're going to align those those two the uh, campaigns I mean the MDGs it will be important to start to check on functions and responsibilities for the ten countries. Um, in the same direction as Anna's kind of question, um, I, um, you presented that the, the partnership is already trying to prioritize the, the, the post MDG process, put it as one of the priorities. But I, I was wondering what about our national directors? Um, if they are already into the discussion or if we are here to connect with them about it because 
especially because we have uh, this new strategy for the new cycle, uh, FY13 to FY15. And if, it, if it's not reflected there, I'm afraid that we're not going so far. So this will happen, but as an special initiative, and I'm afraid that we, we put this, uh, as you said, we, 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 will, we should uh, avoid this to be a special advocacy project. So, how um, sensitive, how engaged uh, already the, the national uh, director? Uh, not, uh, not very significantly yet. There, there has been some. Um, I would say that this was one of the discussions that we had with Dirk Boy, for example, about this event. Um, who should be at this event and um, the question of whether we could invite national directors and he wasn't he wasn't ready for that um, so we we definitely recognize a need for us to be engaging and your yeah your, your point is is very clear in terms of we're not on the map we're not if we're not built into the strategies at the national level then where, where is this going to happen? Where, is the, where are the resources going to come for this? So it's a very, very critical and urgent issue that we need to, we need to figure out. There was, there was three days and he summit and this was not on the agenda. Of which, sir? There was three days of ND summit in London and this was not on the agenda. But you can see the other was learning day. It was on the learning day. Yeah. Yeah, it was on the we had a learning day with, with the national directors. At the last summit of the national directors that took place in the UK, it was in March, we had one day for advocacy learning and there was a marketplace. So within the marketplace, there was one stand on post MDG and the national directors were exposed to that for the, you know, but that doesn't mean Later on, they have been engaged in the decisions that pertain to what Caroline is saying, which is essential. And, and that's something we're trying to see how to work out with global field operations, because we can now go directly to the national directors. It has to go through the line management of global field. I'm just going to say, to, to that point, um, in the strategic framework, should there be some uh, mention of leadership? So in the same way we're concerned about the external leadership, if we don't have strong internal leadership, two or three identifiable leaders of this, whatever you want to call it, not campaign. Initiative. Initiative, nice word. It's nothing. This initiative, <laughs> um, it, it could well fall away. So I think leadership probably needs to be added to our strategic framework. 